Welcome to Testing the Perimeter Fences, How Practitioners of Non-Science Wall Themselves Off from Criticism. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, criticism in this context means joining a group or organization or gathering of uh, people who believe in things that aren't fully supported by science or maybe are on the fringe of what we know and what we don't know, and then just reporting on them. Uh, so I do that with my friend Carrie. Uh, from the title of the podcast, you have no idea what it's about. Oh no, Ross and Kerry means absolutely nothing. But um, that's presumably the attitude that people have when we show up. <laughs> so we get a variety of responses. Of course, when we go to investigate, we're uh, you know we're not we're not saying like, hey, we're here to make a podcast. We use our real names almost all of the time. Very very few counterexamples to that, and and we're there as ourselves. Um, but the, the people that we're interacting with, though we will interact with them as people, they're not our audience. And so there's this kind of awkward divide where you later on now give your honest opinion that you kind of withheld in the moment because you're not there to disrupt, you're not there, you know, you're there to observe and just kind of see what happens. Um, so you put that out into the world and now you have this awkward situation of like, well, if I was talking to you about your beliefs, it would be a different conversation. We'd have a different starting point. Um, and so we get a variety of responses, and that's going to be kind of what we cover in this talk. Um, and I would say the most common is the, you know, just completely unaware. Like, they have no idea that we did it, as far as we know. And that looks a lot like being ignored uh, until they get prompted and then we realize, oh, they do know who we are. Um, there's the uh, passive response that may be, may be passive aggressive. Uh, there's, the, uh, th there's the walling off, the cutting ties. That's another response. There's shielding. Uh, there's a just full-on attack mode. Uh, there's the good humor response and there's the positive engagement response. And none of these are exclusive categories. So, you know, some of these examples will fall into multiple uh, ranges of the spectrum of responses to criticism. And again, criticism just being us giving our honest opinions of here's how we were convinced and how we weren't. Okay, so that first response. Uh, again, as far as we can tell, this is the most common response. Um, we'll, we'll put this thing out in the world and then we'll kind of like you know, gird ourselves, are, are we going to get like angry lawyer uh, letters or are people going to start writing articles about us online? Or are they going to write us an email and tell us how deeply hurt they were? Or, you know, or say they, we totally changed their minds. You never quite know. Um, so likely this is dependent on just size. So when you criticize or, you know, talk about like a really big organization, maybe you're just not worth their time or they're not busy checking their social media every day. So they just don't know that you did it. They're, they're kind of in their own bubble. Um, or sometimes maybe we're just too small of a fish. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a popular podcast, but they're, you know, it's not 60 minutes or something. Um, and, and so we have, you know, like people like John Edward, the psychic, uh, you know, I reported on him in a couple episodes about his cold reading technique. Never heard anything. I'm still on his newsletter. I'm part of his little online group and interact with people on like the johnedward.com website or whatever it's called. Um, you know, no one seems to care. Uh, now, it's a little more surprising with someone like Cindy Kaza. That's another uh, psychic that we've talked about. She said hi. She says hi. <laughs> yeah, every ghost she ever talks to, you know, she establishes this connection. Yes, sir, I'm sensing your, your you know, I, I'll say your mother because I know she's still alive. I sense your mother and, uh, you know, she's, uh, she wears this thing and we get this deep connection and finally just she'll wrap up with, oh, and she says hi when she realizes, oh, I forgot to convey something deep and meaningful for you <laughs> in this interaction with your dead parent. Uh, so, so you would think that she would be aware of us having publicized better because she's not that big of a deal. She doesn't have like a major network uh, presence or a TV show. Uh, same thing with like Travis McHenry. He's this occultist and we did like this deep dive just because he was this crazy guy who not only sold tarot cards, uh, but he also claims himself to be the, uh, the ruling uh, principle of this uh, West Arctica, this like section of Antarctica. It's just like weird random things that he does. So we reported all about him. We talked about his OnlyFans where he jerks off for money and stuff. And you know, <laughs> you would think he's aware of it, but we haven't heard from him. So that sort of one's like, I assume you know, but you decided not to raise it and make an issue out of it. Some are just downright perplexing. Like Linda Moulton Howe is this alien 
she's not a contactee herself, but she writes about other people's experiences with aliens, and she has just the, these crazy things that she says about like the the different like races of aliens that are out there, and she won't. If you hear her talk for more than a minute, she will mention the tall whites and will all awkwardly sit there as she talks about like the Norwegian aliens and how they're our friends. <laughs> yeah, super awkward stuff. But you know, like we're high up in her Google search results. How does she not know about us? But Carrie sat with her just a few weeks ago and asked her questions, no recognition. I've taken pictures with her. You know, she just seems to have no idea who we are. The other one that really surprises me is Bob Larson. He's this exorcist, the most prolific exorcist uh, in the world. I don't think that's a controversial statement. And uh, he, I enrolled in his school. I took classes. I talked about it. I like gave all the details of how you learn his curriculum. We attended multiple uh, deliverances. Uh, when you hear about a deliverance ministry that's talking about exorcism. And he'll even post videos online with, you might see someone familiar. How many? 52. 52? That's me helping hold back the demoniac. 52 generations. 52 generations. That's right. On his newsletter, he sends, you know, hey, Ross from California, I attended one of your seminars and signed up. I wanted to absorb everything and do it right. I was raised in the church, but deliverance was always in the background. He took that as a positive testimony. I was trying to say the nicest but true statements that I could. <laughs> and it just boggles my mind. Like, I'll still get calls from his people asking if I want to be part of the local deliverance response team, if someone has a team. I'm like, how do you people not know? I have, pub I have published like 16 podcasts about you and your organization. <laughs> Whatever. All right, so then there's the other response that, yeah, as far as I can tell, is completely indistinguishable. They've never responded until... Um, we try to interact again. And this is a really good strategy, as long as you can get away with it. If you are peddling something, if you're saying something that science doesn't agree with, or maybe is like taking advantage of people's pocketbooks, uh, you might um, not want your audience to be aware that there are critics of, of you and your position. Maybe if, it, maybe if you ignore them, they'll just go away. Uh, really strategically, it does make sense just to like pretend it didn't happen unless there's a big stir about it. And then it's like, oh great, now we gotta say something. Um, so, uh, and oftentimes they have an audience that's not motivated to look for disconfirmation. So they're not gonna find out about your podcast unless like someone tells them like, hey, are you following that Twin Ray group? Um, it, you should listen to this podcast about them. Uh, so there are people like that, like Twin Ray, for example. They're these new age, uh, this couple, the guy looks like Jesus. And uh, they're, yeah, I could talk about them for a long time. But we reported on them, didn't hear anything, but then we, we reached out for an interview and got a few emails back and forth in before they just went completely silent and realized at that point, okay, they figured out who we are. Uh, Teal Swan, same thing. She's another kind of new age uh, person, very present on social media. Uh, answers in Genesis, I did a whole report like on visiting Noah's Ark out in Kentucky and um, reached out to two of the presenters directly to ask questions, wall of silence. I'm assuming they just went, okay, no, we're not gonna engage with this guy. Uh, this was a fun one. We, every year we'll go see psychics or like call a psychic. We'll, we'll get our prognostications for the coming year and then we check back later and Carrie got read by uh, sister, uh, psychic sister Rocky and uh, wanted to call her back just to ask, hey, uh, how do you feel about the fact that my life didn't go the way you told me it would over the past year? And this is just a little snippet of a very awkward conversation, but kudos to Carrie for holding her own. Okay, and what is your name? Carrie. Carrie? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, you came in with a gentleman? Yeah. Yeah, how you doing, sweetie? Oh, pretty good. Gentleman. How do you remember that? Uh, because you made a blog about me, that's why. Okay, all right. I wondered about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? <laughs> mm, what did I think about it? Uh -huh. I think you just, like, overdid your part. What does that mean? Meaning a lot that I, what I was saying, you just, you know, overacted it a little bit more okay. than, what you know, what I told you. Okay. Well, I wanted to get your impression. I, I wrote down all the things you said would happen, and 
um, you know, a lot of them didn't happen. And I don't know. I was just kind of curious what you thought about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, actually, I'm not there. I'm in New York City. Okay. And as far as to do a reading or like that, I don't have time. And to tell you the truth, I really don't want to reach for you. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> so that's one form of response. Like, you know, we would have never heard from her again, but she was somewhere stewing about our obnoxious coverage online. I don't think we overdid it. I think we represented what she told us. Um, then you have this kind of response where you won't hear anything like we did this, you know, 10 plus part uh, a podcast series on the International Academy of Consciousness, and they teach you methods to do out-of-body travel. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. I think a lot of people... Oh, anyways, it's, it's a big topic. Anyways, never heard anything from them until, like, I don't know, a, like a, at least a year later, they sent this email saying, uh, hi there, could you please remove the image at the top of this page and link to our website? Um, Please confirm when you've removed it. Smiley face. How nice. Very civil. But like, hey, we see you. We think you should take down our picture. Now, there's no reason I should have had to take down their picture. That's another part of this talk is know your rights. Um, there'd be nothing wrong with us keeping it there. But I, I thought it was too fun. So I said, sure thing, confirming that the image has been removed. And they, their response was, thanks, Ross. But here's what happened in the meantime. I took down their image on the left and I replaced it with my own recreation of their image on the right. <laughs> uh, I gotta say, I think mine's better. <laughs> but I, I just love the thought that they went to the website, they saw that, I went, that jackass. <laughs> but they just replied with the thanks. Uh, now, this can really depend on just the personality. So if it's a larger group, they probably have a PR department. They have like a process for handling these sorts of complaints or interactions. Um, if it's a smaller group, um, it, it will come down just to the personality of the leader or whoever's interacting with you. So in this case, you have someone like Catherine Crick. And oh man, what a character. She's here in LA and today's a Sunday. So later on today at one o'clock, I think her service starts, she'll be uh, casting out demons and uh, healing the sick, which healing the sick is just casting out demons. It's, it's all the same thing. Uh, but we published a multi-part series on her, and she would start vague booking uh, about, you know, some parts of God's will aren't fun. The cost of the anointing is truly a cost, but Jesus is worth it. He is worthy of it all. Though there is a cost, there is never defeat. And when you are persecuted, you are blessed and uh, the way I read that is not at all an exaggeration. She would have said it far more uh, exaggeratedly. And, and she's got her Bible verses, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. So this is a really hard nut to crack because she feels she's on a mission from God and it's an unfalsifiable position. There's nothing that could ever happen where she would say, oh, you know what, actually turns out God's anointing of me wasn't a real thing. That's all in my head. Uh, because anytime things are tough or she feels uh, put upon, it's going to be because she's being tested because of Satan, because of all these other outside factors. Um, and it really reminds me of, um, from um, cognitive dissonance theory in general, and one of my all-time favorite books, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. Yeah. 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 Carol Tavris, Elliot Aronson. Oh, I'm clapping and I'm changing slides. Okay. Lesson learned. Uh, so... You start at the top of this pyramid in this illustration, and you could make a decision either way. You could say, okay, I could be the person who does A, or I could be the person who does B. And let's say it's, you know, like, um, I pay my taxes on time, and the person who says, I don't pay my taxes on time. And at some point, you're like kind of 50-50. You could go either way. But once you descend down the bottom of the pyramid, let's say you make that decision, now you paid your taxes on time, you start to... Uh, build back this narrative to sort of justify why you ended up going this way and turning that 50% into like 100% and saying, oh, those other people who don't pay their taxes on time, they're really shifty and, uh, you know, unreliable. Whereas you could have very easily ended up on this other side. And so I think with someone like uh, Catherine, she has made that decision. She's gone over here, but you can tell that she still has this glimmer of discomfort with other people criticizing her. And so she'll do it with the vague booking. Oh, and by the way, I replied to that. I said, and yet it's important that you don't shield yourself from legitimate criticism. And then I quoted the Bible as well. 
Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the ones who need the one who needs correction gains understanding. Proverbs 15:32. <laughs> And I know she saw it because it was hidden. Yes? Um, can you say a little bit more about vague booking? I don't know. Oh, okay. So vague booking is uh, when you, it doesn't have to be on Facebook. This was Instagram. But general, the, the term came from when on Facebook, you're writing about some problem that you're having, but you're not giving anyone any actionable information. You're just saying like, oh, I'm really down in the dumps right now. And oh, making some really tough decisions. And uh, everybody's against me. And you, as the uninformed reader, are going, wait, what are you even talking about? What is this? Someone wants to have their grievance, but minus the content but of what it's about. Names. You don't mention names. Yes, there you go. That's the important key. Uh, yeah, it, Carrie had also replied to this and said, who are you talking about? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> right after we'd released uh, some of our episodes about her. So one test would be just to show up and see what she does with us uh which we may do at some point in the in the future um another response that she has and this is another uh t tactic is to flood the zone so there are videos online that are um catherine crick exposed exposing catherine crick and then talking usually they're like from other christians who are saying that she's not being biblical and how she uses the gospel and so then she starts releasing videos like my response to exposed videos and uh, n not exposing false teachers. And so now she gets to change the algorithm so that her content will come up. And she just produces so much video content. She'll release like a two hour video and then she releases like 12 little segment videos from that. And there's just so much content. If you look for her, whatever's against her will get buried uh, under the, the flood. Yeah. yeah, write it down. Yeah, this is, this is useful intel, right? Uh, another tactic is to cut ties. So uh, it, this is sad for me because I, I like making friends. I like people when I meet them. And when we meet people within these groups, we like them too. And you make friends with them as humans. And usually your gripe isn't with them. It's with the thing that pulled them in. And otherwise, you have so much in common. So it's really tough for me when I get removed as a friend of the Etheria Society and don't get the newsletter anymore. <laughs> Or when I'm removed from EK membership by EK and Carr, and this is them sending me a Dear John letter in 2019. Dear Ross, we are discontinuing your EK membership. Uh, oh, yeah, EK and Carr, <laughs> how do you briefly summarize that? They're kind of a, a new age-ish, oh, man, how do you even describe this? Uh, they have this whole, like, they're based in Minnesota, and their, their ecclesiastical leader is Shri Harold Klemp, if that tells you anything. Like, yeah, they blend like Eastern mysticism and white people Westernism. It's weird. <laughs> um, we are discontinuing your EK membership. If later you'd like to take up the path of EK in earnest, do write in. And you're welcome to attend our open events for the public, but please uh, identify yourself as media and honor the spiritual nature of the gathering. Oh, I was so tempted to write a response. I did not. I was just busy. I, I don't want to get down the pyramid and be like, oh, yeah, I, I was too good for them to write a response. No, I just didn't have time. Um, also, removed from the International Association of Scientologists. That was very sad. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, also... Uh, Yes, okay, Mormons will come up in this. Yeah, that's a different response. Uh, I was also dismissed from an OTO meeting, super uncomfortable, like in the moment being told to get the hell out of there. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that feels bad. So we've already, yes? What, what provoked them to do that? Uh, provoked, the, oh, the OTO? Oh, oh, that's a good point. We learned a lesson there. Don't publish a podcast mid-investigation, and then go back thinking like, oh, they won't have heard of us. It's, it's a group of... Right, yeah, it's a group of 10 people. And yeah, we have gone back to places after replying to them, and you, you enter the room with trepidation, like, uh, am I going to get kicked out? Do any of you? you? You don't seem to recognize me. Okay, we're cool. Uh, in this case, we were definitely not cool. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, so we've talked a little bit about this, but there's the uh, shielding, and the shielding is like keeping your followers from seeing this uh, c content that we're producing or knowing that we exist. So one way to do this is just to discourage your members from interacting with the world, from reading books that are not written by the founder of the group, uh, from not going on the internet, period. Um, and so you get like... Um, 
oh, well, Scientology, they're very good at this. Uh, so they published their um, Super Bowl ad. They do this every year. And so they had this on YouTube. And so I wrote, I did exactly what Scientology is recommending here in this video. I tried it for myself. My friend Carrie and I took the free personality test and immediately the pressure was on. The first class was $50, the second was 100, and we were continually pressured to spend our time with Scientology and buy more book packages and sessions. I spent 22 hours at the local org on one weekend. I was getting ready to sign up for the $2,500 purification rundown when they learned we had a podcast and kicked us out before we'd said a single thing about our experience. Scientology lives up to its reputation, a religion based on the timeshare presentation model. These, <laughs> these commercials aren't for us on the outside. They're to assure the folks on the inside that Scientology is still growing and saving the planet, whatever that means. For those of you still inside, have hope. There's, still, there's a whole wide world out there waiting for you. Um, so like Susan said, I can be mean sometimes. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, they just hid that comment uh, because you know, you've got to curate the online, um, uh, the online look. Yes? How long did it take them to figure out who you were? Mere moments. Yeah, and they monitor our social media too, uh, which is a whole separate story, but yeah. What's that? Hello, Scientologists. Yeah, well, geez, they'd come for Tori more than they'd come for me. Yeah. Which again is uh, sometimes the advantage of being a smaller fry. I came kind of later in the Scientology critique, so a lot of other people like Tori got far more the brunt of their, their wrath and uh, now they've just got too much to manage. But I am listed on their rogues gallery. So if, like, we have that Scientology of the Valley just down the street here. If, if anyone wants to go there on break or something, you, if you're with me, they will recognize me. They will turn me away. Um, they are trained to recognize me and carry. Um, Melissa Scott, this was a fun one. So some of you, Gesundheit may remember Gene Scott, who was on a TV personality for years, and he'd give these like arcane lectures on the pyramids and biblical... Smoking a cigar, talking about his racehorses. Yeah, talking about his racehorses and bringing in like young pornographic actresses and penthouse pets and have them ride topless on his horses. But he's a Bible preacher. It was the weirdest thing. So one of those uh, topless ladies ended up becoming his wife and now is pa <coughs> Pastor Melissa Scott and running the vestiges of his church in, in Glendale, the uh, Faith Center. And they make you get tickets in advance. And we got tickets at the last possible minute so they wouldn't have time to look us up. We showed up once. And by the time we showed up again, they were ready for us, and there are, geez, how many people in suits? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, that person's just filming us. Nine and a person filming us who were like ready and waiting for us to come back and turned us away. Yeah, they look like, yeah, they're wearing earpieces, a lot of them. It's crazy, uh, the security on this place. And let's get to attack. So then, uh, they went online, they created a new Facebook group called Oh No, Ross and Carrie, the podcast Critical Review. And a lot of people join it just thinking like, hey, I'm a fan of the show. This is where I'm going to go talk about the latest episode. And then they get like a, a dull response or someone's like, oh, those people, I don't know. I don't trust them. And so initially they would write all these little negative reviews of our uh, podcast and then they got tired and now the page is overrun by, um, you know, like spam ads, which is fine by me. Uh, but they also created this website called the truth about pastor Melissa Scott.com. And I'll just point out pastor Melissa Scott is PMS. You think she would find a better way to come up with initials. Uh, but they had like articles about us and our site and why we're just unfair people. You get the idea. Um, uh, so attack can come in the form of an online response like that. Takedown requests, we get those a lot, being threatened with lawsuits. Uh, just talk about takedown requests real quick. Uh, Shakuntali, Carrie did an interview with her, super awkward discussion. And next thing you know, uh, not only are the episodes uh, that we posted about her getting takedown requests over iTunes, but then she's like making individual requests on her Facebook page. And you know Facebook, we've all been in Facebook jail. Like they'll take down the content first and ask questions later, or they won't ask questions and it'll take a long time to get it back. Anyways, she created trouble for us that way. Um, similar responses from some of these others. Uh, there was this guy who was a numerologist and we actually, we thought he was impressive as a cold reader and we wanted to have him on the show and he agreed. And then he finally listened to the podcast. I thought he already had. And he was just so incensed. He was so angry. And he said, my family are all lawyers. We're going to come after you. And I said, oh, please, 
I mean, do, but also don't for you. Like, it's a bad, this isn't gonna end well for you, but, but kind of do, because that would be fun for us. Because we have had people threaten us with lawsuits. This is the, the Raelians. Uh, uh, we've got another Raelian in the audience. <laughs> I attended your baptism. <laughs> um, or demystified baptism. So this is them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's where a guy told me, I'm sure it's all true. Uh, when I was describing what they believe. So this is them telling us to cease and desist and remove all of the media that we've published. And, um, and then our lawyer replying very uh, cleverly and cogently and them completely backing down, which is great. Uh, Rhythmia was a uh, ayahuasca retreat center in Costa Rica that we were invited to on their dime, except you know we, we bought the plane tickets. And so these are texts from a Jerry first misspelling his own name, which is really weird. I was like, that's weird, Jerry. I thought it was Jerry with a G. And anyways, uh, so at the time, this is not a story worth going into in detail, but we left our SD card with our recorded interview. And so he's like, don't worry about it, man, it wasn't meant to be. Uh, and they probably found the SD card, but they didn't want to give it to us. But I had a backup recording on my phone, so I used that instead. <laughs> and so this is, a, this is a, an email thread where he's saying, don't worry about it, brother. And he was totally playing like the, you know, hey, you're the guy in this, in this establishment. I'm going to talk to you. Hey, bro, you know, it, it's fine. It, the whole trip was on us. Let's just not talk about it. It wasn't meant to be. That's okay. Um, but no, I said, we're still going to go forward. Carrie and I published our podcast. And they sent us uh, lawsuits. They sued us in Costa Rica and LA. I got served at work by this guy who like came and freaked out my wife at our apartment by sneaking into the complex. Um, yeah, awkward stuff. But oh yeah, happy ending to that. They ended up, uh, this is our anti-slap motion. They ended up owing our lawyer over $10,000. So. Oops, shouldn't have done that. Uh, which is another point. Know your rights. Uh, so oftentimes the lawsuit is just an intimidation tactic. It, most people just step down, back away, like, oh, I, don't want, I don't want a lawsuit, what do you do? Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're doing what you're allowed to do, uh, be bold. Um, now this, I don't get this so much. This is like being called a shill, um, being called an operative. Uh, Susan's been called all kinds of things, like from an a evil mole rat. No, I have a group of people. Oh, you have a group? Oh, so you're the queen, because they're like social insects, but in the mammal kingdom. Okay. Yeah. Wait, wait. Guys, it doesn't matter. Are you saying they don't have queens? No, they just couple. No, Oh, okay. All right. Well, all right. I'm going to need. Tonight I'll be reading about mole rats. They're fascinating creatures, so I, it's not a bad uh, comparison. But uh, I, Brian Dunning of Skeptoid.com posts these all the time of people saying things like, yes, the opioid epidemic was manufactured and profited by Big Pharma. You are a shill for who, what, or why we'll probably never know. Your ignorant condescension is what makes me want to throw up in my mouth. <laughs> it, you know, you are a minion mouthpiece that isn't very good at your job. I get a little bit of that, but I think it's because I'm not on Twitter that I don't get a ton of that, because Carrie says she, she gets called a shill or a mason or whatever. Well, anyways. So, a variety of responses. We mentioned the Mormons. Sometimes you get just a really good response, and I think that comes from a certain amount of security. If you know you're not in a fight for survival, then you can take some criticism. So the Mormons, uh, famously, they replied to the Book of Mormon, the play, by taking out ads in the playbills that would say, you've seen the play, now read the book. And they've got a happy, smiling black person as if the original book didn't uh, describe the, the followers as white and delightsome. Um, and they, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow black people to be in the priesthood until 1978. As the musical says, in 1978, God changed his mind about black people. Uh, and you think, oh, priesthood, okay, well, priesthood, that's kind of high up. No, in Mormonism, everything's inflated. So just being a member of the church means you're in the priesthood. So you couldn't even be a member of the church until 1978. And they're like, oh, don't, don't worry about that. But they are confident enough. They've got food stored up for generations, and uh, they don't care what we say about them. And they actually had a really positive response. They, they kept us in the family. I still get letters from my local wards asking me to come, like, hang out, go to services. And they said that they didn't see it as negative coverage. So, you know, good for them. Um, and then my favorite is positive engagement. So 
Occasionally, we've had people come on the show who we've covered, and maybe they start out angry, but they're willing to have the conversation. And so this is me with a copy of the Piscabulary of Urinisms by a <laughs> urine therapy practitioner who came on our show and is a bizarre guy, but a good egg. Yeah. And uh, so we've had other people, like uh, David Stewart gave us this long series on the end times, and he really cared about what we were saying and our criticism. You could tell it affected him deeply, and he was willing to talk about it. Uh, some other great examples there. Uh, but, uh, sorry, I've thrown off the schedule a lot, but um, I'll wrap up just by saying, don't stop. The important thing is that we keep doing this, because maybe, maybe your target will never know what you did. You're like a gnat on the giant. They don't care. But people standing around may hear it, and they may not get, they may, that may slightly stem the tide of new people coming to join them. Or maybe they will know about it, and it'll just make them angry and get under their skin. Maybe it'll change their practices, and they'll be a little different about how they let people in. Maybe they'll be a little less welcoming because they know that people might actually be listening to what they're saying and thinking independently about it. Um, and at some point, you, you might just break through. And it, w it won't always be with the organization. It won't always be with the members who are the most diehards. But we get emails all the time from people who say, I was in Mormonism, and thank you so much for your series. It started me, like, we'll, we'll have people saying, I avoided listening to this particular investigation for years, but I loved everything else you said. And finally, I said, OK, let's see what they had to say about it. And I'm out of it now. Thank you. Uh, it happens. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so just keep doing it, because you have to apply that constant pressure back, because otherwise, they'll keep towing the line and moving forward and at least hold the position. Uh, and, and it's also a good reminder for us that this also applies to us as well. When we have criticism of our own approaches and beliefs, uh, we should be willing to be open-minded to that criticism and, and not closed off to the idea that maybe we got something wrong. So, no, Wendy disagrees. And that's the great thing about Skeptic Camp. We don't have to agree. I love it. Thank you. That is... <laughs>